Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. My philosophy is that card payments is a process, just like any other process, inside a large organization. And if you can measure a process, you can improve it. So our business is providing payment analytics that allows organizations to measure, benchmark the performance of their payments. That was Anand Goyal, the president and CEO at Optimized Payments, and he is our special guest this week. This is episode 76 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. And hey, before we get started, if you happen to office in Houston, Austin, or North Texas, check out Fuse Workspace, where their mission is to help others do more. Check them out at fuseworkspace.com. Okay, back to the show. Anand went to middle school in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, high school in Houston, Texas, and went to the University of Texas in Austin for his undergrad degree. He worked at MCI Telecommunications in a management training program, left there and got his MBA from Babson College and stayed in Boston. And in his words, I got into the payments industry because of a girl. Ultimately, leaving Boston for Atlanta, where he worked for Elevon and then started Optimized Payments. Optimized Payments is a payments analytics and consulting firm that has been in business for 14 years. They allow organizations to measure or benchmark the performance of their payments. They built a -a one-of-a-kind SaaS platform that consumes transaction data from all of the big acquirers to not only help their customers save money by reducing the cost of accepting payments, but also to enhance or drive revenue, as well as many other interesting use cases. Most of their clients do billions of dollars in card payments, so clients like Apple, Verizon, Staples, Waste Management, and more. Currently, two-thirds of their business comes from recurring SaaS fees for the analytics platform, and a third comes from their traditional consulting business. On the personal side, Anand has two teenage daughters and enjoys spending time with them. We've got a great episode today, so let's get started. Hi, Anand, and thank you for being here, and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Thanks for having me on your podcast. So let's dive right in. Tell our audience a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that. Sure. I went to middle school in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I went to high school in Houston, Texas. And then I went to University of Texas at Austin for my undergrad program with a focus in finance. Right after college, I started working for MCI Telecommunications in a uh, management training program. In this program, I got a chance to spend uh, two years in operations, two years in finance, and uh, almost three years in uh, marketing. And I love this job because I started it in Austin and I got a chance to move around and experience a lot of new places, places like Sioux City, Iowa. It was okay. (laughs) Denver, Colorado, which I really liked and Washington, D.C., and the Arlington, Virginia area, another area that I really liked. Towards the end of my tenure at MCI, which was almost seven years, I developed a strong interest in entrepreneurship. So I left MCI to go to Babson to get my MBA. And Babson at the time was known for their entrepreneurship program. So like after I finished my MBA, I was living up in Boston, And I got into the payments industry because of a girl. I was working in Boston, and then I met a girl in Atlanta. As we were set up, we started this long-distance relationship. We dated for about a year, and things were going really great for us. So I decided to move to Atlanta. And uh, so when I moved down here, I was looking around for jobs, and I got an interview with Elevon. At the time, they were known as Nova. So I uh, landed a job and started my career in payments. I worked at Elevon for four years as the director of pricing and analytics before leaving to start Optimize Payments in 2007. And so now I have two beautiful teenage daughters and I live in Atlanta, married the girl that I was dating back in 2003. And then uh, on a personal level, I love running and uh, biking. 
I think it's a first for all the podcasts that I've done in the payment space that someone said they got into payments because of a girl. <laughs> I think that is definitely a first. All right. Well, let's switch gears. Let's talk about optimized payments a little bit. Tell us what optimized payments does. Optimized Payments is a payments analytics and consulting firm with a 14-year track record. So, Greg, given your background in payments, you're going to appreciate the complexity, risk, all the back office work, and the cost that comes along with card payments, specifically and electronic payments in general. My philosophy is that card payments is a process just like any other process inside a large organization. And if you can measure a process, you can improve it. So our business is providing payment analytics that allows organizations to measure, benchmark the performance of their payments. And what that means is we consume raw transaction files on behalf of our merchant clients on a daily basis. So we built this unique, one-of-a-kind SaaS platform that consumes transaction-level data from all the big acquirers, pay facts, alternative payment methods. I'll illustrate this with a couple of examples, but our platform does four key things. Number one, we normalize payments data from all the different payment vendors. So as you can imagine, you know, the file specs from Fiserv and FIS Amex, Discover, PayPal, they're all very different. They use very different naming conventions. We normalize all of that. Number two, our platform, it consolidates data from all these different vendors into a standardized data schema across all vendors. So we consolidate data. Number three, our platform enriches the raw data that we get from the vendors. So for example, we have bin tables that provide attribute data about the card, like what country the card was issued in, the bank, the type of card. We have interchange qualification and fee tables that benchmark data and identify savings opportunities. We also have merchant ID tables that provide attributes like location, business unit, region, and various types of roll up. And then the last and the fourth item that our analytics platform does, it it visualizes all of that voluminous amounts of data. So we have online dashboards that are updated daily. So merchants can see their key metrics at a glance or drill down to at a transaction level. So merchants can also receive email alerts when a value exceeds a threshold for any given time period. So for example, if you know declines are really important to a merchant, they can configure an alert to say, send me an email anytime my declines exceed 4%, or send me an email when my chargeback ratio exceeds 60 basis points, or send me an alert when my downgrades exceed 2%. Now that's a lot of information, but let me give you a very tangible example. We have a client in the hospitality space, and they have six different processors that they work with. So they have Chase, Amex, Discover, PayPal, Global Collect, First Data, slash Fiserv. We consume data from all of these vendors on a daily basis, and we go through all the steps that I just previously outlined. And what our dashboards and our data files allow this merchant to do is One, it allows them to reconcile their accounts receivable at a transaction level. And number two, it allows them to understand their fees and identify specific opportunities where they can reduce their fees. And for a lot of large merchants, cost of payments can be one of their top five operating expenses. So this expense line can reach tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollars a year for many of our clients. So what our dashboards do is provide clear visibility into the complex world of electronic payments. It benchmarks, identifies gaps, and then we recognize that they're not necessarily payments experts at all these companies we work with. So we supplement our analytics with support so our clients know exactly how they can take action 
on specific initiatives. Another very like specific example is we had a client that did a significant amount of business to business card sales. This client was getting level three qualification, but they were missing out on large ticket qualification, which has cheaper interchange rates. And the issue was that this merchant was sending a null value instead of a zero in a specific field in the settlement file. Now, this is very, very sort of in the weeds, granular. We're able to isolate this issue out of all the data and help the merchant understand it and fix the issue. And they saved $2.2 million a year in just interchange fees. Wow. So most of your customers, it sounds like, are larger merchants? Most of our clients do billions of dollars in card payments. We do have some that do hundreds of millions, but I would say most of them are, you know, hundreds of millions or billions a year in card payments. Okay. And then you said sort of the support around this analytics, is that what you would consider consulting? So you come in more from a consultative perspective and then build the analytics around that? Exactly. So we have two sort of services, the analytics that I spoke about, and then the consulting. And even on the consulting, we rely heavily on the data analytics. Our recommendations are driven by data. So even for our consulting clients, we'll consume a sample set of transaction level data that gives us sort of unique insights into lease cost routing, opportunities to negotiate with the card networks, opportunities to implement alternative payments. For example, we had one luxury goods client and using transaction level data, we identified specific stores where they had a significant number of Chinese customers. So they use those specific stores to test a pilot solution to accept Alipay and WeChat mobile wallets. So it's not just about finding opportunities to save money. It's also the ability to find opportunities to increase revenue or try new payment types, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Our clients take PayPal, Amazon Pay. It's to make sense of all that data. Our original focus was savings, but now we're getting to all these other use cases beyond savings. You know, revenue, enhancing revenue, reducing declines, managing chargebacks, reconciling. So that's part of the opportunity we see is with our platform, we're trying to address as many interesting and unique use cases to make the lives of our clients a little bit easier. And do you go direct to merchants or do you work through any third parties or sort of how do you go to market? So to date, we have worked with and created value from some very large and sophisticated merchants like like Apple, Albertsons, Verizon, Charter Communications, uh, Waste Management and Staples. That's been our typical foray. And I think now we're kind of expanding it to looking at ISOs and Payfax. Because our direct to merchant is typically enterprise merchants. We don't do anything in this SMB or mid-market space. But we see there's an opportunity to serve those segments through Payfax and ISOs. Okay, that makes sense. What would you say differentiates your company from your competitors out there? I think we have a very unique data analytics capability that we've built over 10 years that I haven't seen replicated in the marketplace. Surely, if you look around, you'll probably find about a dozen consulting firms, but none of them I found can match the insights that we create through our analytics platform. And although we have this platform, we're always looking for ways to enhance it, create new use cases. There are some firms that say they do analytics, it's mainly spreadsheets that they do, and they link some sort of a BI tool on top of it. But we have invested a significant amount of money and resources. We spent millions over the years creating this robust platform that it would be pretty hard for someone just starting up to replicate that. Hey, everyone. As you know, I've worked in the payment space for a long time. A lot has changed over the years, and we talk about those changes a good bit on the show. But some things in this industry never change. For example, attrition is always a concern, and so is your bottom line. And PCI noncompliance fees will always be a part of the industry, driving that bottom line, but also keeping us up at night, worrying about that attrition, especially when the inevitable PCI noncompliance fee hike is underway. 
That's why I'm excited to bring in company.com as a sponsor. Right when you're increasing fees, give your merchants something of value too. The company.com security suite is the perfect way to add value by offering a real-time security dashboard with antivirus, expert tech support, anti-phishing software, dark web scanning, and more. Company.com offers various product assortments and solutions that have proven to reduce merchant attrition for years now, and this new security suite that complements your current PCI program will be a game changer for you. Learn more at www.company.com or email securitysuite at company-corp.com. The link is also on our website. And now, back to my interview with Anand Goyle, the president and CEO of Optimized Payments. Where do you see the payments industry heading? I mean, you're obviously in a sort of segment of the market dealing with data that the data may never go away, well, never will go away, but there will be more of it and more of it. But where do you see the industry as a whole headed, say, in the next, say, two to three years? You know, it's obvious that card not present and e-commerce payments are going to continue to grow. I mean, that's pretty obvious. But so will connected payments, payments that are connected to your wearables, to phones, to cars. So there are companies like P97 that are allowing you to pay for gas with your phone and charging the card on file. So I think connected payments is going to be big. I think you're also going to see a rise in alternative payments. So whether that's the current sort of hot thing of installment payments, but also payments tied to bank credentials like ACH payments and crypto payments. As you kind of noted, all of these payments are going to generate tremendous amount of data that will need to be consumed and analyzed for various use cases, you know, reconciliation, cost management, reporting, and better understanding your customers. So I think we're in a perfect spot to grow and consume all these different data relating to these payments. And if you could get your crystal ball out, where do you think things are headed in 10 years? I think the mobile payments are going to be huge. It'll become even easier to use your watch and your devices to pay for things. And you may pay for them before you arrive and you pick up your items at a store, whether that's ordering ahead or some of the things that Amazon is testing where you walk in and all the items that you're going to carry out with you they automatically get assigned to a basket. And then the wearable that you're wearing will automatically be charged when you exit the store. All these different kind of COVID accelerated a lot of these things you were talking about as far as the omni-channel and the different way people are paying for things today. I think all of those things were in the works in some way, shape, or form before COVID hit, and then COVID accelerated a lot of them. Being that you see sort of the backside of the data, what do you see that's really changed? I mean, is it these companies you're working with that are so big, they're just getting the same volume from different channels or sort of how does that play out when you start looking at the back end? So it has some interesting implications. Take example for grocery stores, right? In the past, we were all going to the grocery store. There were some customers that were using online services. I mean, there was a small percentage of a grocer's overall mix. But now with COVID, they've become a meaningful percentage of their total mix. What COVID did was took a bunch of these card present EMV dipped payments into card not present payments. So it had a couple of implications. Number one is it grew their cost of card acceptance uh, significantly. And number two, it also added a, a measure of fraud too, because now with EMV, you have very little, if any, fraud and, and you were protected against liability. But now you take those transactions to card not present, and you have an increase in fraud. So companies are trying to wrap their head around how do we kind of, given our tight margins that we have in the grocery space, how do we manage these costs? And uh, so that's kind of one dimension. And it's also prompting them to see, are there other alternatives we could offer our customers that would be of less risk and cost? And maybe customers may value as well. And maybe they might get more loyalty points. So there are grocers that are looking at how do we use ACH credentials? 
Can we link them to their loyalty card? So whenever they buy in the store or even online, we can charge their card and maybe they might get additional points if they have a loyalty program or additional sort of benefits or coupons that might make them use those cheaper alternative payment credentials. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about your journey to your role there. You've talked a little bit already about sort of your background, how you got to payments, a little bit about your first role in payments, but maybe pick up from where you left off there and talk about how you started optimized payments. I think even you changed the name of the company at one point. So maybe talk about why you started it, how you started it, kind of your journey there as a founder of the company. Um, when I was working at Elevon, this is, I started there in 2003. I was there for roughly four years and I was in the pricing and analytics group. One of the things that I saw in my role was that the buyers of merchant services in large organizations were typically treasurers, someone who reported to the treasurer and definitely someone who was in the CFO's sort of organization. These individuals had a hundred things to worry about and being payments experts weren't one of them. They might do an RFP, they might renew their contracts, but they weren't very savvy in their decision-making process because quite simply, just they didn't have the bandwidth to understand all the nuances of payments. And I said, I think I've had enough of corporate life Because right after undergrad, I worked for a large telecom company for seven years. Now here I was working for Elevon, which is a part of U.S. Bank. And I said, you know, I I would love to start a company that helped corporations, corporates, make better decisions. So in 2007, I started Optimized Payments Consulting. Originally, the focus was solely on consulting. How do we advise clients? to make better decisions or give them recommendations so they can sort of optimize their payments infrastructure. Four or five years into my consulting role, I had a client, a large client that did about a billion dollars in card payments and they had four different payment vendors. The treasurer there, he had access to all this data but did nothing with it. And so his ask was, hey, can you take all this data and give me some reporting and analysis around it? And that kind of started our journey into payment analytics. So as I thought through, how do we build this capability for this client? How do we consume data and normalize it? That started us on this journey where we built our platform slowly, and then we accelerated, and then we built this very sophisticated process. And it's all housed in the cloud. And a couple of years ago, we, we realized that we were now a payment analytics company that did consulting versus just a pure consulting firm. So we did a rebrand. We dropped consulting off of our name. And now we're known as just Optimized Payments, a payment analytics and consulting company. And one of the things that I track is how much revenue are we getting from our analytics business versus our consulting business? And I think at the end of this year, you know, we'll be about close to two thirds coming from analytics and the remainder coming from traditional consulting work. Because analytics, it's recurring revenue, it's monthly subscription fees that we charge, and it's a lot more scalable than our than consulting business, you know. So my focus has also kind of changed over the 14 years because I think initially I was very focused on operations and execution. Now I find myself spending more time focusing on longer term initiatives, talking to clients more, understanding some of their needs, doing some more longer term planning and focusing on building solutions that will meet our clients needs, you know, a year or two down the road. And a part of that is also building a team to kind of execute all these initiatives that we're working on. So what is something that you're passionate about? Maybe mention one thing that's work-related and one non-work-related. For work, I care a lot about customer success and satisfaction. When I look at our competitors, when I think about maybe just traditional consulting firms, they tend to really focus on winning a project, regardless of the results they provide, 
or the value that gets realized by their clients. I contrast that approach with our approach where we really care about customer success and we measure ourselves based on customer succeeding. An illustration of that is our net promoter score. I'm not sure if you've ever heard about NPS, but it's a survey that we did to our clients, current and past clients last year. And we just asked them one question. On a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to recommend optimized payments to a friend or a colleague? So it was on a scale of one to 10. So if they gave us a nine or a 10, that's considered a promoters. Mm -hmm. If we get a score of a one to six, that is considered a detractor. And then if you get a score of a seven to eight, that would be like a neutral. Mm -hmm. So based on that scoring, when we tabulated all the results, we got a score of 96. And just to put that in perspective, two companies that I love, like I love Apple and I love Ritz-Carlton. They're a part of the Marriott. Those two companies have a NPS score of 68. We get a 96. So that tells me that our focus of customer success is really resonating and that customers value that the work we're doing for them. So that's on a business side. On the personal side, I have two teenage daughters. I love spending time with them and sharing their interests. And right now, most of that is music and theater. I take them biking and I'm trying to get my older daughter into running. And we went running yesterday and I did three and a half miles with her and it was kind of her longest run. And it gives me a chance to spend time with her and just to talk. So I love spending time with them. I always ask this question because I feel like everyone brings sort of a unique perspective to the answer. And, you know, you mentioned how and why you got into payments. I got into payments sort of just by chance. Wasn't, you know, an industry at the time for me, you know, 16 years ago, wasn't really an industry that I was looking to get into, sort of fell into it. Since then, things have changed a lot, right? With all the money that's being pumped into the industry. And now you kind of lump fintech into it. It and it's become sort of a sexy place to work. What would your advice be to someone coming maybe right out of college? They want to get into payments or fintech. What would you tell them to do to be successful? So if you're coming into the payment space, you know, payments are so nuanced and complex. Learn as much as you can. And whenever an opportunity presents itself, try to be as close to sales as possible. Because I find whether you're working inside of a company or you're trying to start up a company, the, the single most important um, function in any company is sales. Because it is sales where rubber meets the road, where you know a client will tell you where they value your product or service and they're going to buy it. Because you learn a lot from customers, even when they don't buy something from you, you find what their reasons are and what their priorities are. And that's very informative, just as informative as you, you know, you closing a deal, winning, a, winning an account. So if you're inside a company, getting close to sales will allow you to be close to customers that will allow you to understand the market. So, so do that. If you're trying to start up a business, again, focus on customers and sales. You know, sometimes people can lose themselves while building a sexy technology or a concept and trying to raise money. But if you can get a customer or a prospective customer to pay you for your service or solution, you have a good idea. If you can get a lot of someone's to pay for your service or solution, then you have a business. So focus on connecting with the prospective customers, understanding where they are in the buying cycle, whether they're willing to pay you money for whatever it is that you're doing. And that'll give you a sense of, hey, do I have a, an idea or is it a real business? Well, we've covered a lot of ground today about you, about optimized payments, about the industry as a whole. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? Payments is fascinating. I find that I've been in it now for 18 years in total, and I'm always learning something new. So if you enjoy learning new things, payments is a great space. And 
and I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. So, and, and Atlanta is a big hub for payments. So if you happen to be listening and you're in Atlanta, this is a great industry to be in. But and even if you don't live here, there are companies that are mushrooming everywhere around the country. It'd be a great industry to get into. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate your time. I know it's very valuable. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much, Greg. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 